Yes. Yes, it is. If you read the title and you thought, yeah, Egghead is the best arc post time skip in One Piece, and hopefully I wrote that down right in the title, uh, I would say yes. Now, because we're going on a, a month long break after chapter 1111, I thought it would be cool and you know a fun little thing to get my thoughts out there about Egghead Island the arc as a whole and I feel like Egghead post time skip is probably the best arc since Zo. Uh, I think it's better than Wano I think it's better than Whole Cake Island even though I like a lot of Whole Cake Island I love Katakuri I feel like there's a lot of stuff going on in Egghead that is just very well done compared to other arcs. And it's so condensed. And it's like, it's like Zoe 3.0. If I had to put any other arc objectively beneath this post time skip, it would be Zoe. So I thought it would be pretty cool since we have this break to make a little more One Piece content. And so we're going to talk about Egghead. And I have some notes about just some shit that went on in Egghead that I thought was noteworthy. <laughs> and we're just gonna, I'm just going to rattle some of them off, not all of them, some of them off and give my quick thoughts about it, uh, tell you where I am. Now, for the overall general like feeling that I have for Egghead, uh, I think it's a really good arc. And if I had to number it, it would be about an 8 out of 10 right now. And it's not even finished, right? An 8 out of 10 at the least. Now, it could end, you know, on a bad note. It could uh, peter out towards the end. But I have a lot of faith that this is just too good to not fuck up. And I actually think that it's too good not to let it let a bad ending of an arc uh, bring it down. Maybe like half a score. But I still think it'll be above an 8 at the end of the day when this arc is done which might be next year because we're going on a month-long break. Anyways, so anyways, I'm just going to go through a few of these um, major p plot points that happened during Egghead and give you my quick thoughts on those. Uh, so technically, Egghead started around 1058, or at least that's what I googled and that's what I got. And 1058 was when we got Buggy talking to, you know, Mihawk and Crocodile. We get their bounties, this and that. Buggy is one of my favorite characters in the entire series. Um, and I want to bring this up. If you don't know who John Wayne Gacy is, he is a serial killer who killed a lot of young men back in, you know, the 70s or 60s. I was reminded of Buggy because Buggy's a clown and John Wayne Gacy was known to be a clown. And I don't know where I'm going with this. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, Sabo and Lelucia Kingdom. I'm going to group all this together. Sabo and Lelucia Kingdom uh, was elevated in the anime. In the manga, it was pretty eerie, but in the anime, they really made that shit look like a movie. And I thought it was pretty badass. Um, now, I'm mainly talking about when Lelucia Kingdom was blown up. And we don't know what it was or what kind of weapon it was, but it was the girls say, and they're on some shit. Now, the, the incident between Kobe, Blackbeard, Boa Hancock, and the Seraphim was fucking crazy. I remember reading it thinking, who are these little kids that look like the warlords, but they're not the warlords? This is insane. And so I remember just thinking, you know, all these little in-between moments between arcs, um, do they count as part of Egghead? Uh, I believe so, because the Seraphim are essentially born from Egghead. And them being set out on the world uh, and being involved in incidents like this is pretty significant. And it was pretty crazy to watch in the anime as well. Um, Rayleigh coming in there and putting his foot down on shit. Um, but then at the end of the day, realizing that he's not strong enough to beat Blackbeard in his current day. And then um, Shaki being revealed to be a former princess of, you know, Boa's uh, kingdom, whatever it was called. And Kobe gets kidnapped. Uh, kidnapped. Uh, he was taken away. Um, 
Oh, by the way, look at my phone. See that shit? Another thing that happened was Luffy talking about his dream. Now, this is where I have to admit something uh, pretty embarrassing. I am sort of dumb. <laughs> I, I feel a little illiterate because I do not remember Luffy having a dream on top of being Pirate King. So when he was talking about this, I was like, what the fuck is happening? Um, but apparently, it was made clear to me. Please don't um, hate me in the comments. But it was... It was made clear to me that he has a dream on top of being Pirate King. Pirate King is just a stepping stone, you know, the power that he needs in order to achieve his real dream. And we still don't know what it is because every, we get everybody's reactions and it's like, what the hell? We get another cliffhanger on top of other cliffhangers, which Oda is uh, known for. And but it keeps us, you know, in suspense and wanting more. And we do get more. Bonnie comes back into the story. Bonnie, yet another supernova, being integrated into the story. And we are getting more and more about her and Kuma. It is revealed that Kuma is her father. Uh, I'll get into more bon more Bonnie stuff later on. But I like having her back uh, on screen. It's nice to have you know these existing characters uh, get more screen time. Then we get introduced into Vegapunk. Vegapunk was probably the biggest surprise that we got out of the whole arc, well, at least in the beginning, the the fact that we were getting to know who this person was and that we got baited switch by Lilith, who is the evil version of one of many Vegapunks, these punk bastards. And in, it's just breadcrumbing us into uh, the arc a little more. You know, we, we hear that there's one Vegapunk over many because she has uh, a number on her on her suit, and so we're just wanting to see who the rest of them are. For the most part, the Vegapunks are cool in their own right, but the standouts being Lilith, Shaka for sure, and York for obvious reasons, she's a snitch, uh, makes them pretty interesting, but most of them, like Pythagoras and Edison and Atlas, you know, they're not as important, but they're still cool. And then we get a little bit more from uh, Kobe's side, where Helmeppo and Hibari, a new character, who we presume is all Akainu's daughter, granddaughter, whatever, who is secretly in love with Kobe, uh, begging Prince Groos, another cool-looking character, uh, to go and save Kobe, along with Dahl, who is there too, and is cool. CP0 is back. Well, they're back with new members, including Rob Lucci, and the dude, <laughs> Rob Lucci, coming back as an awakened Zoan, having the sash and having our introduction into the, the sash, being an awakened Zoan like marker. And Luffy going against Lucci one on one and Lucci actually actually holding his own for a while. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy about Lucci and how he was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Luffy in the first place did not sit well with a lot of fans. For me, I don't personally care because I'm not really a power scaler. I'm in, it, I'm in it more for the story and the characters. But I'm sure when this started happening, there was a lot of people commenting and debating whether or not this made sense, this is like real, this is bullshit or not. But I don't care. Lucci is a cool character in my book. And seeing him come back to do something, I guess, significant um, is a good thing in my eyes. So welcome back, Lucci. Then we get other reveals like Stussy being a clone of Bakken, um, which we haven't really touched back on. Like who Bakken really is. Like she was a member of Rocks. Please correct me if I'm wrong and don't be mean about it. She was a member of Rocks. And but who is this? You know, who is this child of Whitebeard, supposedly, that she's been tagging along with? Who is Weevil, really? Is he really a descendant of Whitebeard? Or is he just some random, like, child Bakken scooped up and brainwashed into believing that he was and seeing that the potential that he had um, just made him believe it even more? I don't know. Uh, but the fact that she has a clone named Stussy, who is CP0, is 
uh, crazy. And I feel like most people don't think about it that much. Uh, I just don't know why. <laughs> she's this crazy vampire chick. And she's pretty badass. So that happened. We got Law versus Blackbeard. Law got folded. And then Beppo came in and gave the final strike and got him away. Now, a lot of debate has gone around uh, about Law's crew and how effective they are. And are they useless? Well, especially compared to Blackbeard's crew. Um, people like Van Auger has really shined in this arc. Because Van Auger is apparently that guy. He is everywhere. He is in the cover stories. He is... He was in Whole Cake. He was with Aokiji. He was, he's he's everywhere. And now he's back <laughs> in Egghead. Well, towards more of the current uh, chapters. So Law's crew sucks. Except for Beppo and John Bart, <laughs> I guess. It really sucks to see Law go out that way, but he is more of an assist fighter. Mind you, I'm not a power scaler, but he is more of an, an assist fighter, especially you know when he was... Hanging around the Straw Hats, it became more apparent, especially when he was fighting against Dolph Flamingo with Luffy. He is more of like support, but he held his own and he had his homeboy come in and save him. Speaking of in between events, we get a one shot of Shanks versus Kid, which is one of the most damaging, most embarrassing most just humiliating uh, for kids image that we've seen thus far. And it hurts me to say, because I am uh, a bit of a kid fan. You know, he has all of the tenacity with none of the talent. And I just feel for him because he's always back up on his feet. Him and Killer are a really cool duo. And I just want to see better for them. But unfortunately for them, their kid is a little too tenacious and they went against probably one of if not the strongest character in one piece which is shanks one of the best things to happen in this entire arc is kuma's flashback um kuma is arguably one of the best written characters um up there with sanji and he hasn't had that much screen time um most of the story since Sabaody, but what he does or what he did in this arc is um, makes him a contender for being one of the best written characters in One Piece. One of the one of the times I actually got emotional reading manga um, was through One Piece. It happened when Sabo came back and Luffy's face was like a full page of him being shocked. But the second time I could say, reading One Piece, that made me a little emotional was when, you know, Bonnie heard the the memory of Kuma telling her happy tell her how tell her happy birthday, and they showed her crying, and it just uh, really hit home that so Kuma is just that dude, and he is going to be number one for a lot of people. And he's up there for me. He's a top five One Piece character. I love that dude. I love Bonnie too. Now, let's get to the Gorosei, the five elders. When Jay Garcia got his fat ass out that chair, out of that room, and started heading towards Egghead, I did not think things would turn out the way they would. The fact that he has this crazy devil food power with these crazy subset powers, like holding people in place, some kind of like instilling fear, conqueror's hockey. And the fact that he just kept getting more and more involved into the story, into the fight was crazy because we did not expect one of the elders to do all this. We all thought, well, for me, at least I thought he was like a placeholder. He wasn't like a real fighter. I thought, well, one of the reasons why I thought this was because that time where they all, all the Gorosei kneeled in front of Emu, it made them seem like not as powerful, it just not as important, and just, you know, not real fighters, not a real problem for the story. They felt like placeholders, but I was proved wrong 
yet again. <laughs> but before I get to that, let me mention two more characters before I go into more of the Gorosei. One of them being Kizaru. Kizaru had some of the most nuanced moments uh, in Egghead so far. We got a lot more from him than we ever had since film Z. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that he did was very questionable, did not, um, was not portrayed as endearing as probably Oda wanted it to be. Kizaru is kind of like covering his eyes and it looks like he's crying, but he's really not. And he's all about the mission and then it's just very wishy-washy. And so another character, another couple characters I want to mention is Aokiji and Garp. Their fight was fucking crazy. Um, watching Aokiji get blue hold, watching all of, all of these like former and current admirals get more screen time is always good. But watching him get blue hold was crazy. And <laughs> Galaxy Impact is uh, one of the more impressive feats in the story coming from Garp. Um, we really don't know how strong these old men are. And it's being made very apparent that Kobe is really um, shaping up to be uh, the eventual fleet admiral or whatever they call it. Yo. Now, back to the Gorosei. So the last chapter that we got was crazy because we get all the Gorosei and their mystical beast forms. So we get pretty much all of them. We get the boar, fucking Hakuna Matata. We get Sesame Street, Big Bird. Uh, the Sandworm from Doom. Dune. The Liza Gaib. And then we get the Ghost Rider along with Jay Garcia. Now, the Ghost Rider, Nusjuro, is probably the best designed because he looks insane and he looks like a character out of Berserk. The, that whole panel, that full spread panel, Looks like a page out of Berserk. Berserk Light. You know how there's Ranch Light? There's Berserk Light. And not to compare the two because One Piece isn't really that kind of story. They did look pretty, you know, eerie and very similar to the God Hand, which is the best thing I could say about it. But um, to think that, you know, we get the Gorosei and we get them in action is pretty uh, mind-blowing because... Who would have thought we would have gotten to this point by the end of Egghead after all the shit that was going on, including the fight between Zoro and Luchi, who he seemingly beat, but we'll see. But yeah, I really love what's going on in Egghead. I know y'all are, re are reading each and every week, which is why it pains us to have to wait these last like month after 11-11. Um... I do plan on maybe doing more One Piece content in between that time. Maybe even like tier lists or who's your favorite fucking character, movies, shit like that. Something One Piece related because I need my One Piece fix. And the week to week grind is always tough when we have these long breaks. But the author and all these mangakas uh, need a break because we all we are all people and we should not be, you know, upset. Uh, of them having to want to take breaks because imagine you're working like week after week and you don't get a day off or you don't get like vacation. They're like, fuck you. That would suck. But this is a well-deserved break because we have gotten chapter after chapter in Egghead that have been so damn good that this boy needs to rest his big brain brain fruit head. Mr. Vegapunk in real life. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you made it this far, let me know what you want to see. One Piece related, maybe tier lists, character tier lists, how I feel about the Straw Hats just in general. And yeah, enjoy the break. Uh, thank y'all and I'll see y'all later.